Hello everyone, welcome to another Polyphonic Q&A. As per usual, this is going to be awkward because I don't usually talk on mic when I'm not scripted, especially alone. But yeah, so first of all, I just wanted to say thank you guys all so much. You guys asked so many questions. Your your support was really overwhelming on that last update video. Um, there were so many nice comments. You guys really, you guys really made my day, and it was really a ton of fun reading through all the comments to to find questions for this. I'm really sorry if I didn't get to your question. That's that's just the way of things. I tried not to answer questions that I've already answered in my previous Q and A's, so you might be able to look back on some of those for um if if you're looking for answers to some of these, and if not, you can also just hit me up on Twitter, and I'm I'm more likely to. Um, respond to questions there just because I don't have a constant deluge coming at me. But I really did try to get to as many questions as I could, and I tried to get to questions that I thought were really particularly neat and thoughtful. So right before we jump in, just big thanks to everyone who supports me on Patreon and everyone who signs up for Nebula. I know I repeat this a lot, but that really does help, so big shout out to you guys. All right, um, speaking of Nebula, I, I've had a number of questions about my Dark Side of the Moon project, so I'm going to tell you guys what's going on with that. Before you worry too much, yes, the rest of the project is coming. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that it'll be on Nebula next week, maybe, or maybe the week after. For the sake of transparency, I want to let you guys know. So basically, in the fall, I was working on this project, and I was kind of in the zone, and then um, just kind of got busy as as you do in the fall. I had Christmas stuff and then we ended up moving apartments on New Year's Eve and there was some stuff that I'm not going to talk about, kind of personal stuff going on too. So that really derailed this a little bit um, and it's been hard to kind of pick up where I left off and get back into it. And then also the friggin' pandemic hit um, and that's kind of thrown my whole mental space out of whack a little bit. So yes, the rest of the Dark Side of the Moon stuff is coming. I'm going to sit down and force myself to do it within the next week or two. So it'll be up on Nebula there, and then later it'll be coming to YouTube. But I'm sorry it's taken so long to get the, the backside of this. It's just really hard to kind of... I, I, I stopped dead, and it's hard to pick up that momentum and keep the same aesthetic and the same energy in the project. But, but it's coming, I'm gonna finish this project, I promise. Alright, on to some, some various questions. There's no particular rhyme or reason to how I chose these. I took a bunch of screenshots of questions, and I'm just, you know, reading through them all as I go now. Okay, so, David Sally asks, what are my favorite album covers of all time? Oh, that's a really good question. I mean, there's kind of some obvious ones. Dark Side of the Moon comes to mind. Pretty much anything by Hypnosis. I love what Hypnosis does, and and a big one they do that I love. the The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway is is an all time favorite album cover for me. I love the cover of Algiers' new album. Um, the design on that is phenomenal. It's very up my alley, and really like any of the Blue Note Records covers. I love that old jazz cover look, and some old Sinatra covers too. Um, those are really really cool. I got a couple questions asking about how I um, kind of have learned to to see music like this, and that's that comes from a couple places. A lot of it was just like, I just used to sit around and, and read everything I could about music I loved. Um, I read some music books, but a lot of it was just browsing, finding interviews and stuff online, and that's still actually kind of my research process now. So really, it's just reading a lot and talking a lot about music and just kind of surrounding yourself with music and thinking about what you listen to. But then more structurally, a lot of my critical thought comes from I have a minor in English and a lot of literary theory has helped me analyze this kind of stuff. And you, you can learn to kind of read a text through that. And then my major is in journalism, and I was a music journalist. So a lot of that stuff comes from just talking with bands, writing reviews. Really like anything, though, it's it's just putting in the hours. If, if you read a lot about music and try to write a lot about music and stuff like that, you'll improve at this. So yeah, I think that that's, that's basically it. Okay, I love this question, um, by Ned Erty. 
Blue Oyster Cult once said the creature known as Godzilla needed to go, even though at the time the song was written, Godzilla had just foiled the plans of a mad scientist controlling a kaiju known as Titanosaurus, as well as helping defeat a group of aliens who rebuilt the original Mecha Godzilla to take over the world. Yet Blue Oyster Cult also says that one shouldn't fear the Reaper, even though on average, 6,316 people die each hour due to the Reaper collecting their metaphysical form, or soul in layman's terms. The question is, if Blue Oyster Cult are justified in their hatred for Godzilla and their passive feelings towards the Reaper... Well, I think that Godzilla helped, um, you know, foil Titanosaurus uh, and defeat Mecha Godzilla. I don't think that means that Godzilla has completely atoned for the blood of his destruction. And I think um, for Blue Oyster Cult, the Reaper is more of a, a metaphysical force. Like like you said, it's it's collecting their metaphysical form. And I think that for Blue Oyster Cult, there is an inevitability of death. So when death comes for you you personally shouldn't fear it. And I think that that's talking on a more personal level, whereas Godzilla caused havoc on on a catastrophic level, and, and maybe the people that he killed shouldn't have feared the Reaper because it was their time to die, but I think Blue Oyster Cult don't think that that means that you're justified in killing another person. I, I, think, I think that's really where it comes from, is Godzilla had agency and chose... To kill these people and yes he's atoning for it now yes maybe he saved a lot of people but but i think that that's still tainted by by the destruction um that godzilla that godzilla caused in the first place so i think that that's where the where the uh godzilla and reaper dichotomy um comes in SNC asked how i manage my time and i think i got a couple other people kind of asking about my process i work pretty regular hours most days I start work around 7 or 8 and work until 6-ish, sometimes 7. If I'm in the zone, sometimes I'll work longer. Um, if I'm not, sometimes I'll work less. But generally, I try to kind of hold myself to a steady Monday to Friday schedule and then chip in a couple hours on the weekend. Dividing time for the passion projects. A lot of the time, the passion projects I'll do at night. Um, I try to create some structure in my week so that you know, I can, I can get things done and I can hold myself accountable kind of during these like nine to five ish hours. I don't let myself not work. This is work that I need to do. So I hold myself to that schedule in a very rigid way. And then I can kind of clock out and do some of my passion projects after. I've gotten a number of questions about kind of contemporary artists. Like, like here's one from Drake Gear Timmons who asks, are there any artists that I'm expecting to blow up or hit their stride in 2020? And the thing is, like, I'm not actually that in touch with what's going on now. There are some modern bands I like and some modern groups. Some some modern groups I'm listening to a lot right now. The Comet is Coming are um, are phenomenal. I'm You've probably noticed I'm a big Hosier fan. I think he's doing some really cool stuff. And I guess No Name, um, I think she has a lot of potential to do some really cool stuff. There's a lot of interesting bands doing interesting stuff, but I don't I don't really try to predict um, who's going to blow up. I, I listen to a lot of things on my at my own pace, and I try not to get too, uh, too caught up with what's going on right now. Maybe that's a good thing, maybe it's not. I don't know. <laughs> Deepak asks, who's my favorite Beatle? George Harrison. I am a, I'm a George fanboy. Um, I just I just think his songs, all, a lot of my favorite Beatle songs are George songs. I think he's got this real raw honesty to him. And I, I mean, obviously his guitar playing is incredible. But as a songwriter, I mean, Something is one of the most beautiful songs ever written. I Me Mine is a severely underrated deep cut. While My Guitar Gently Weeps is one of the best Beatles songs. And I just, I just kind of like his, his ethos and his approach to music. I think it's very compelling and holistic, and I think it, he creates really good songs. Makit Amir asks, how does someone start exploring a genre? And I think that's tough, because I think what happens when you explore new genres is that you're looking at them through the framework of the music that you understand. So a lot of the time when people um, have a hard time getting into a new genre, it's because, let's say, for example, you're trying to get into jazz and, and you know rock. 
there are some similarities there, but for the most part, if you're approaching jazz through a rock framework, you're not approaching jazz on jazz's terms. And so you're not going to appreciate the things that that make jazz great. And and I think that that's, that's the struggle that a lot of people have. And I think talking to people who know the genre is a great way to get a sense of this. Ask them what they listen for when they're listening to this music. And then I think you can get a sense of that genre's terms and you can come to it on their terms. If you try to if you try to come to music on your own terms, you might like some, you might not, but if you try to open yourself up and be like, "Okay, what does a jazz fan like about jazz?" Don't say, "What do I like about jazz?" Don't say, "What do my rock ears like?" Say, "What does a jazz fan like about jazz?" and then listen for those things and and you might be able to learn to pick up and appreciate those things. Ale Spam asks, what do I recommend to someone who wants to start a channel with content on culture and music too? Just start it, man. I had a bit of a head start because I knew some video editing, but when I started my channel, I didn't know that much. Start it, make some stuff, feel it out, and put it out in the world. And the big thing that I'll say is just do it for you. Don't do it because you want to get rich. Don't do it because you want to get famous. If you're going to start a channel, do it because you have something to say and do it because you really, really want to do it. Don't go in expecting to change anyone's lives. Don't go in expecting your channel to blow up. I, I didn't go in for any of those stuff. I just I just did it because I thought, hey, I, I would like to see this kind of stuff. So I, I did it. Um, and, and to this day, I still try to make videos that I would want to watch and I try to make my art um, for me. So that's all that I would say is, like, don't be scared. Just buckle down, think of a topic, write a script, maybe get a friend or two to edit it, and then just record it and put some visuals out there. The biggest thing that I will say is, um, if you're serious about it, give yourself a backlog before you put it out to the world. Because the nature of YouTube is, in all likelihood, unfortunately, you'll probably mire in obscurity. I'm sure there are so many video essayists doing incredible stuff that I haven't come upon. But if you get lucky, like I did, and if the algorithm decides it likes one of your videos and it picks up, you want to have that backlog so that you can just keep putting videos out and keep kind of, you know, using your success. I didn't launch Polyphonic until I had five completed videos in the bag. And, and I still, that helped me for so long. So that's what I'll say is make a couple of videos and then just put them out there. Um, I was just some guy. I'm still just some guy. The infamous muser asks a couple questions. Uh, would I ever consider doing a tutorial? Here's the thing is I am so self-taught that all of my stuff is so friggin' sloppy. I, d I don't keep my assets organized. I don't name my layers. Like it's really... It's really messy, and I probably do a lot of things in really inefficient ways. I think that's the biggest, my biggest concern with tutorials is I have a lot of bad habits because I'm not really trained in this. I'm self-taught in a lot of stuff. I don't want to teach people those bad habits. I'm sure there's more efficient ways of doing 80% of what I do, but I've considered it. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll do it someday. Um, I don't know, though. We'll see. I got a couple questions asking about weirder bands that I like. Yeah, I like weird music. Uh, I, I love Captain Beefheart, especially Doc at the Radar Station is a severely underrated album. Other weird bands, I mean, do the Talking Heads count? They're they're kind of weird. Ornette Coleman. I love Ornette Coleman, and I love a lot of free jazz and avant-garde jazz. Oh, also, I like Zappa as much as the next guy. I like Tom Waits as much as the next guy. I've got a weird side. I think everyone should. Eric Webb asked a couple questions. Um, he asked, did I always approach music with this kind of passion and curiosity? And I think I kind of touched on that before. Absolutely. And then he also asked, has researching a song or artist for this channel changed my perception of them? Absolutely. It does all of the time, almost always for the better. I think I think one of the biggest perception changes, I guess, is just like Scott Joplin and Ragtime. After doing that video, I had such a deeper appreciation of Ragtime as a genre, and that's really cool. 
Giorgio Ban asks, which person had the most significant impact on my taste in music and appreciation of it? That's probably my older brother. When he kind of first started to get into music on his own, he introduced a lot of it to me. So a lot of my early favorite bands, uh, Green Day, Billy Talent, Sum 41, The Killers, like a lot of this stuff in kind of like the mid 2000s he introduced to me. And he also he also kind of got me into Pink Floyd and Led Zeppelin and stuff like that, too. So I'd, I'd say he probably um, has has been my biggest musical influence along along with my parents. My parents have great taste in music and they brought me up on music. Yeah, really, my family is uh, is really who has had the most impact on my appreciation and taste of music. Bastian Levesque asks, what artists had the potential to change music scene but didn't? Um, yeah, I think Sid Barrett, uh, which he mentions, is a good example. I am just, like, eternally curious as to what, what the pop world might have looked like if Amy Winehouse hadn't died and hadn't struggled so much with addiction. I think she is a singular talent who is incredibly unique, and I think she could have really done a lot for the pop world. I also think if we're if we're going with the 27 Club now, I think there was still so, so much more to be explored in Nirvana. Um... And I think it's a real, real tragedy. I, in my mind, In Utero was their best album, and it felt like they were just maturing more and more and could have done some really cool, compelling stuff had Kurt Cobain not died. And then also, if we're doing the 27 Club, let's say Jimi Hendrix too. I mean, Jimi Hendrix, before he died, was lining up collaborations with Miles Davis. Like, I want Bitches Brew era Miles Davis working with Jimi Hendrix. That is a music world that I want to live in. Sandalwood RK asks if there are genres or styles of music that I initially didn't understand or were averse to, but came to love. Absolutely. I mean, really, most things outside of rock I didn't listen to until I was in my 20s. When I was in high school, I basically exclusively listened to rock music. And now, in my daily listening, traditional rock makes up about probably not even half of what I listen to on a day-to-day basis. Um... David Campbell asks about my assets. So a lot of the assets, uh, some of them I make myself, but the vast, vast majority of them uh, actually come from Wikimedia Commons. Captain Spooky asked if there's any genre that I'd like to touch on more. All of them. I I, I really want to get better at touching on stuff made outside of the UK and North America. But it's also tough because I don't I don't speak many other languages. Um, my my research requires me to read so many sources, and it's just it's hard to find sources written in English about non English artists. Unfortunately, because I would love to do some of this stuff. Brandon Justice asks, "Is there a topic that I refuse to make a video on?" Not that I can think of offhand. I do have one rule, which is that I don't want to make negative videos. I always, always think it's better to celebrate what we love about music rather than to knock down other musicians who just happen to not align to our personal tastes. Insert Clever Name here asks if there's ideas that I started working on and then abandoned. There are so many of those. I have so many scripts sitting completely untouched. I might release those on my Patreon or something someday. I'm not really sure, though. Juan asked for some channels to recommend on Nebula. If you like what I do, then Middle 8 and Volksgeist are absolute go-tos. Oh, also 12 Tone, if you like music as well. If you like, like, general knowledge, I'm a big fan of Wendover, Second Thought, uh, Real Life Lore. Patrick Willems is also awesome if you like film. If you like film, there's there's a fair amount of great film stuff. Nando V Movies is on there. Cinema Wins. Yeah, I think I think those are some recommendations. Also, the originals. There's some really, really cool originals. Uh, Tom Scott's new original, Money, is bonkers. I liked, I liked this question a lot from Oscar Mike. Um, he asked my seven wonders of modern music. Seven genre-defining albums, the absolute must-hear for each genre. So I'm going to do the seven genres that come fastest to me. In my mind, the definitive jazz album is kind of blue. For hip-hop, it would probably have to be To Pimp a Butterfly. For rock... uh, I guess Dark Side of the Moon. I guess it's got to be. 
for country, I do Johnny Cash live at Folsom Prison. For pop, I guess it's probably got to be Thriller. For R&B or Soul, I'd say Songs in the Key of Life. And then for metal, probably Paranoid or Master of Reality. Uh, I hope those are genres that work for you. I don't know. Gregory Stratman asked what the best video I think I've ever made is. Probably my Degraded Media video or my Scott Joplin video. Um, those are at least content-wise. Visually, the video I'm dropping next week is... Uh, it's something else visually. <laughs> I've got a couple people asking how making videos has changed the way I listen to music. And it's changed it in a lot of ways. Sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. Sometimes I find it hard to just sit down and enjoy music now without thinking, oh, this could be a video idea. Oh, what's going on here? But I also think it has broadened my horizons and made me listen to way more music and made me appreciate a far, far broader swath of music than I ever would have before. So I'm incredibly grateful for that. Aaron Mahoney asked for some of my visual influences. So early on, my visual influences were a lot more in the video essay realm. The The animator who does a lot of stuff for Vox, Ariel Costa, is, is a huge, huge influence on me. You can check his stuff out. I'll put a link to his website there. Terry Gilliam, the stuff he did for Monty Python, I... I love that stuff. And then another big one more recently is actually uh, Robert Rauschenberg. Okay, so we'll see We'll see what this is after editing, but this is an hour of raw recording. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it there. Thank you guys so much for watching. If, if you're still around here at the end, thanks for sticking around. Uh, be sure to, you know, like, comment, subscribe, and hit the little bell. Do, do, do. Uh, but, but really that actually like unfortunately that does help me a lot so if you could do that it'd be great <laughs> um yeah i don't know thanks for tuning in let me know if you want me to do another q a soon i guess follow me on twitter follow me on patreon sorry if i didn't get to your question i've uh, there's a lot of questions yeah i don't know i'm i'm tired now so so i'm gonna peace out and edit this thank you guys so much for watching you guys are the best. Stay safe, stay sane, stay inside.